What up, ladies and gentlemen? Jesse Warden here. Today we're going to talk about TypeScript. I'm going to do a small intro, okay? TypeScript is very large, and we're going to do just a small subset. Um, we're not going to cover a lot of the neato function scope thingy boppers and all the intricacies of how they match ECMAScript. We're just going to cover the bits that matter, that'll make you productive, that'll give you time to experiment with it, perhaps on your unit test, right? It's a good gateway for transpire languages. So it doesn't actually affect your user base. So I'll talk about that too. So again, my name is Jesse Wood from Cup Cup Web App Solution. We're going to talk about really the fundamentals. Who am I? My name is Jesse Warden. I am a software consultant. People call me, they have problems, they have projects that don't work and they call in the experts. So it could be anything, you know, web-based is usually what it is, front-end based, but I can do back-end stuff, whatever else. My partners and I, we like to be awesome, do good work and salvage things that are busted. That's what we do well in very negative situations. I do not care which stack, okay? As long as it's client side, I'm happy. So if it's Ruby with a lot of Angular or it's Python with a lot of backbone, I don't care. That's my thing, that's where I'm coming from. Again, the demographics for TypeScript in general usually is enterprise software devs. Developers who are at least on two men or more teams or two women or more teams, right? You have multiple developers in the same code base, okay? Not one developer on five projects. Enterprise software developers have large code bases. There's also game developers. Game developers who are doing a lot of data intensive work tend to like TypeScript because it allows them to do HTML5 game development with some strong typing, right? And uh, a lot of their engines that need, you know, really good compiler help when they're doing a lot of math and stuff, it helps. So they like that even though it only has one number type. So what is type TypeScript? What's the value? Well, it has strong typing. Okay, so JavaScript does not have strong typing. Everything is a variant or some weird version of null and undefined. In TypeScript, you actually have types, okay? Including your own types. We'll get to that. Number one, it had two has classes, okay? Any JavaScript language that has, you know, is a transpiled language means it's transformed into JavaScript. It's gonna have classes because that's what most people who start off building these things feel like JavaScript's missing, right? Now it's in ECMA, okay? TypeScript is really big on ECMA. So if you're curious as to like, what's the point of it? Well, classes and following, all this stuff follows ECMAScript to the T. They're very strict about it. It has modules and asynchronous modules. What that means is that you can support both modules, like the ECMA way, you can define you know, a form of namespaces. You can organize your code base in modules. It doesn't have to map up to files. This can all be in a single file. It also has asynchronous modules, which is utilized for now, either CommonJS or AMD export modules, okay? It's not really CommonJS per se, they have exports, but it's a little weird. And integration, it integrates with tools, it integrates with uh, existing JavaScript libraries. The reason that TypeScript has got a nice sweet spot is that the .NET developers who typically don't enjoy JavaScript can write TypeScript and even little, little bits of it to integrate with their front end in their tool, you know, Visual Studio on their PC, and it works very well. Those of us who are doing larger projects can integrate strongly typed languages such as TypeScript with loosely typed ones such as jQuery, Backbone, Angular, whatever else by simple interfaces, okay? And finally, compiling. The whole point of strong typing <clears throat> and modules and all this stuff is having a compiler that says, hey, I just want to let you do something wrong. So it's a step above JS hinting and JS linting, okay? We have a compiler that allows us to know that, hey, we're doing things right, we're optimizing certain ways of coding things, we're generating the type of JavaScript that you want, okay? Good compiler, really good, or transpiler, whatever you want to call it. So why TypeScript? Well, first, before I even get to that in my slide, this guy right here, Jesse Warden TypeScript. <laughs> it's the easiest way. So if you go down here, I wrote this article a while ago, but the guy who invented TypeScript is Anders Heisberg. This guy invented Turbo Pascal, Delphi, and C Sharp. Okay, he invented C Sharp. So, or one of the people involved, and he doesn't have a beard, which makes him very unique as a language developer. One of the most popular languages in the world used for Unity 3D, used for .NET, used for, you know, just about everything. C Sharp is the most wonderful language that people love. And this guy said, we're gonna make a better JavaScript. So that's, Right there, that's that's the validation, okay? So, beyond that, why would you use it? Well, it's strongly typed. The compiler helps you with immutable data types. So numbers, you know are numbers. Now you're saying, well, Jesse, we can pass whatever we want in the JavaScript functions, not with TypeScript. If you define those types, you have a nice, strong API on those classes. Whether you're doing simple function calls or you're doing 
model view controller frameworks like Backbone and Angular, and you have the models that have specific calls, even in Backbone, which allows you to have configurable objects, you can define those value objects as types, and the compiler will help you verify that you wired up everything well before you even attempt to run it and test it, right? Before you even run your unit test. That's the strong type. This has nothing to do with your type. So someone once asked me in an interview, he said, why use TypeScript when you have CoffeeScript? I mean, how many types are there really in JavaScript? That completely misses the point of data modeling your data. As you know, a lot of these applications go from the server to the front end, right? And you have 90% of your code running the cloud some, on some middle tier like Python or whatever else, and you now run 90% of that code on the client, you're using a lot of the data objects. You're, you're building your own CRUD layer. You're building your own you know, data access layer, whatever else, right? You, I mean, not core data level, but you're getting pretty close. It, the apps are getting that size nowadays. So you're develop, you know, using types. You're using a person VO, not just some JSON object, okay? TypeScript can allow you to describe those objects, put them in an API, and you have nice, a, a nice, wonderful, strong typed API, and the compiler can help you if they don't wire up right, right? So JavaScript can't do that. TypeScript can. Number two, the compiler helps with everything I just said. More focused unit tests. So I, of course, from the ivory tower perspective, of course you should write unit tests. You should write good valid unit tests. You should write unit tests that, you know, work with testable code. You should write testable code so your unit tests are nice and actually can test them, right? But the point is, is that most people don't right? Unit test. This is the way it works. It's very difficult to sell to a client. People who get it, get it. The rest are like, why do you want me to write code twice and extending my development time for this supposed, you know, lack of bugs? I'm not buying it. So it is what it is. So if you're going to write unit tests, you can at least write more focused ones. The compiler can help you with that. If you're not going to write unit tests, cool. You now have a compiler to help you with simple errors. <laughs> Fantastic. This in addition to the JS hint, JS lint, okay? It's not myopic as it sounds. I'm really trying to be positive. Number three, it uses ECMA 6 and, well, I make up 7 and 8, but really it, ECMA 6 is very strict, ECMA 5, okay? You can use that ECMA 6 today. The code that works yesterday is going to work yesterday and today and tomorrow. So anything you write in TypeScript is going to work. It's going to work for older browsers. It's going to work for newer browsers. It generates JavaScript. So you don't write TypeScript and run it in a browser. There's no source mapping. I mean, you can, but there's no source mapping to your actual TypeScript. It's writing JavaScript. So it's assumed that you know JavaScript. You just want to utilize TypeScript for its features, okay? Number four, compiler helps with misspellings. So simple misspellings with these contractual obligations, it helps with, which is pretty cool. Number five, obviously classes, duh, but classes from a inheritance perspective, from a super class and subclass perspective and from an overloading perspective versus overwriting. Fantastic. Awesome stuff. Packages or namespaces. They're not really namespaces. If you look at the way that they're implemented, it's very confusing. They're getting better, but it's not as, unless you're using Visual Studio with local modules, it's not as simple as something like Java or Python where you can import the model, module, have a reference to it and utilize you know, a class from that particular thing or a function. It's not that simple, very frustrating, but it's a way for them to, you know, sell Windows and Visual Studio. I get it. If you're on a Mac, it's so sad. Inheritance that works. I already talked about that. Uh, retains the functional aspect of JavaScript. So I was so excited to see a to-do MVCS. If you don't, you don't know, any framework, any awesome, large, hyped library is put on the site called to do MVC. And what it is, is it's a way for you to see how to do a simple to do app in a JavaScript framework. So you can see how they use Backbone to do the same app, how they do Ember to do the same app, Angular, Knockout, yada, yada. And you can compare and contrast the implementation, right? That helps you learn from sample code and compare and contrast the framework. The problem is, is that the way it was written with TypeScript is extremely functional. It's like a JavaScript developer said, oh, I'm gonna borrow some of the cool things in TypeScript. Cool, you got the compiler aspect, you integrated with existing libraries, but it's not written like a C sharp or Java developer would tend to write code, right? So it's it's definitely not something to judge, okay? So if you read see this presentation, immediately go to to, to do mvcs.com and then look at the example codes. Do not judge it based on that. The the author is very functional and likes promises and chaining and things like that. Okay? You don't have to write it like that. It strictly follows ECMA. They are very strict on the forums answering posts about you know only features and bugs and th such they'll implement as long as they follow ECMA so even though it's Microsoft and you can say what you want about private you know, they are 
really, really strict about Fallen ECMO, which is cool and uncool. It's cool from people respecting it, uncool because I want all this awesome stuff and I don't really care if it follows the standard because it's not JavaScript. <laughs> so I don't care. So why, again, also it integrates with JavaScript with optional strong typing. So you can do a little bit of TypeScript or a lot. You can integrate with languages that aren't typed and you just won't get type safety and that's okay, but your TypeScript will work. Or you can wrap a contract that's strongly typed around it, such as jQuery overrides with their function that does multiple you know, values, right? From an override perspective language that supports those things like Java. And the strong typing is optional. So if you don't want to strongly type strings or you just want to strongly type anything to any or don't want to strongly type at all, that's fine. So it supports modules. This is why I love it because you can do packages and it's built into the language. It exports to require JS. So anybody who does classes and minimal amounts of dependency injection with some of the weird configuration variables that require does, you can use modules. Fantastic. Now I use AMD. I know a lot of people like CommonJS. It supports both. It also exports to object prototypes. So here is the difference. There is a interview question that's really annoying, but people love to ask it to challenge your knowledge of programming. Because if you don't know this, you probably don't know MVC, you probably don't know OOP, and you probably can't really accomplish anything in the company that they're hiring for. I'm being sarcastic. It exports the object prototype for the performance values, right? So there's this big thing, like the guy who created JavaScript and JSON and Ajax is like, well, I like closure-based classes. So I don't want to use, you know, prototype. I want to do objects and return functions and you know, put in the module pattern and call it a day. There's others who are like, yeah, but object prototype is very fast. You can create multiple instances and it's optimized. Not really. So here's the key. The only thing you need to know about the object prototype optimization is that they do not put properties or getter setters or whatever on object prototype. It's assumed that everything is an instance base. Now, if you know anything about object prototype is that every single instance of the object prototype class will share the same value on the prototype until that value was changed. Then they each get their own unique instance. And there's no real polymorphism because if you change it, it doesn't change for you know sub instances as well, right? So TypeScript's like, look, we'll put methods on there. Cool. We will treat an object class just like a method. And it's a normal prototype based class with some fixes for super inheritance and overloading. Fantastic. But for properties, no, they're all instance based. There's no such thing as sharing properties on prototype. Okay. So optimal class performance. That's the whole point of exporting strong typing so let's talk about strong typing beyond the types of you creating what is the, the strong types it has any so you can do nothing and it's consumed to be assumed to be any but if you type any it's known to be any thus when you're developing apis you can accept any type number two is number there is no int there is no float no unsigned blah 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 it's just number the point is that it's assumed to be a float okay it is boolean notice they're all lowercase and string and enum i believe there's date but we don't care about those these are the ones that are a big deal enum is a huge topic unto itself which is great if you've ever tried to e emulate enums <laughs> even with a good editor such as sublime or webstorm intellij it's awful the enums just get really nasty so the fact that they provide it is wonderful they have a lot of other ones that are small and minor but those are the big ones so let's talk about some of the data types i'm going to show you some examples here so as you can see this guy right here is x is any okay y is the same thing just because it doesn't have typed it means it's the same thing okay so b and a have no values it's the same thing as casting them as any because they're objects right they're object with the properties of that object notice that this function x you know f f with x or my function x is cast as any there is no type here there's no string it's just you can pass make x whatever you want and the console will log it up to the console also note that log and debug and everything else in console takes any as well, right? So you can create an interface on top of that to say any. The point is, is that these are synonymous, but this is explicit. It means you meant for it to be any. So if you pass a string and a number, it's okay. Versus, I didn't mean for you to type pass me string. Well, then cast it as a number or whatever else you're casting, okay? Number, same thing. You can cast a number explicitly. Uh, this is also treated as a number. Notice I didn't do it for Y. Same thing with floats or decimals. And same thing with strings to, that are fixed to that. Okay? I'm sorry. Property the number. Sorry. Boolean, same thing. They, too, have a cast. It's implied that these are both Booleans. Okay? You're not going to cast it. You're not going to type Boolean, but they are Booleans. And string, same. St string gets a little tricky, but it supports the double quote ones, the single quote ones. 
And if you're getting a particular character using the string method, they're all cast as strings. It's just this one is explicit and intentional and the compiler, compiler will help you. If you do not do that, sometimes the compiler is smart at guessing, sometimes not, okay? They do have type inference. And this is what I was talking about, the compiler guessing. Notice how last name is actually known or the return value, right? Whatever evaluates inside this parentheses, it's known to be a string. So it's expected that this function is going to return a string because the two values that you're concatenating here or adding together are a string, okay? So the compiler has some forms of type inference. Got it? Notice we didn't type string here as this, nor did we type the return value to string, right? You could do that if you wanted to. Got it? All right, now let's talk about ambience. I keep talking about integration and you can do strongly type integration. What does that mean? It merely means that global variables <laughs> can be defined like so. You say, hey, declare var document. Trust me, it's a global, it's already there, it's in every browser. Same with window. So you can do this and the compiler will say, okay, cool. Versus the compiler going, I don't know what document it is. You didn't define it. Well, I know because it's global, it's by the browser, right? That's how you declare it. Same thing with jQuery, right? jQuery and others have to be shimmed usually on require.js to know that they're already predefined either from some library or somebody else who brought it in internally. TypeScript can do the same thing. So you can declare, you already have variables there. Please utilize them. I've declared them, compiler, ignore them unless I provide additional interface information, right? So that's the basics of those guys. That's all you need to know about strong typing. Classes, yes, it's a real class. It exports to a mishmash of prototypes and closures. <laughs> all kinds of nasty stuff. Now here's the key. It is formatted nicely and it is for the most part readable, okay? So if you're into prototypes and everything else, you can go take a look at TypeScript's playground and how it generates, okay? And I can show you right now, actually, because I can. So if you go to playground on typescript.org, it will generate left and right. So you can look at how it looks when you actually have a module, you have a class and it generates. Notice that it has the module pattern, right? And it'll export it out. Now it defines it up top. Now this is tricky, you don't have to do that. You can just snag the internals and get rid of this and call it a day. They're doing that for module reasons. So if you compile your entire TypeScript into a single file, it'll work. The challenge becomes if you have multiple classes, you have var saints declared twice. So it gets a little tricky and I'll get to that. And this is one of the frustrations that people have had. But the point is it generates it. You notice that the function is a normal function. Your method is on there, right? You have your greet method and it generates normal JavaScript. You can do the same thing with, if we show you the normal class, okay? So that class will go to a normal one. It's a little bit more readable, right? As a greeter, but notice that the greeting, even though it's a property, is not on the prototype. So we don't get that weird thing I was talking about where every single instance points to the same property until it changes it. And then it gets its own unique instance. Now, people who like prototype-based programming think that's awesome. For the rest of us, it's really confusing and it's not helpful. Usually when I create a class, I want an instance space. If I wanted a static variable, I would go greeter dot property equals some value, right? That's static. That way everywhere can have the same value. Once you set it to pro pro prototype, it's only static some of the times, right? Completely useless, not helpful, not good in object-based oriented programming. If you're a functional programmer, you don't even care about this stuff anyway. So TypeScript does it, has super, um, all that stuff, okay? It has inheritance. It allows you to call super base classes. It has a super keyword, right? If you're an action ship developer, you're like, well, I've been doing that since 2001. Well, good for you. JavaScript developers and TypeScript now have it. Public, private, and static. So you can utilize public. You can utilize private, right? Now, is it really private? Of course not. It's a variant based language. You can dig your way into even closures and hack your way in there. It's harder, but you can do it, right? They don't enforce any of this at runtime. This is all at compile time. Once your code is JavaScript, this is meaningless. All the private and public and static doesn't mean anything. And no, it doesn't have protected. I know everyone's sad. I've already said super. All right, now let's show you some class basics. I already showed you what it generates. Let's get a little more specific here. So you have a class called point, right? It has the class keyword. You can define a constructor. Constructor gets really deep. If you want some more details, go look at the TypeScript documentation or look at my blog post where I cover a variety of examples of how you can do that, okay? It's made for ActionScript developers, but it doesn't matter any language you come from, you'll be able to understand it, unless Perl, in which case you're really smart or really strange, one of the two. So 
Notice how you can do public, it's defined there, it automatically sets those instance variables. That's one of the thing of saying public X. I know it's a strange syntax, but it follows the ECMA standard, so whatever. Notice we have a public length function and you have a static property, right? So you can also do interfaces. So when I say classes, you can take an interface and apply it to an existing object and treat it as a class, right? So you have that whole programming by contract model that tends to work in Java and C Sharp. It works just fine in TypeScript as well when you're doing JavaScript, right? Which is cool because sometimes the JavaScript you're dealing with is not yours. It's another library. So you can still get that contract and strong typing over top of it. Win. All right. So you'll notice, again, we have a point and point. We have a class point and we have a type point. What's the difference? This is saying P is of type point. This is a class constructor when we go new, okay? Notice the different colors because they have a TypeScript plugin for Sublime. This is awesome. This is helpful. And if you cast it to something else, the compiler would go, no. And it would help you before you even compile and run your code and unit test and all and blah, 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 blah. Cool stuff. Okay. So that's the class basics. Modules. So let's talk about modules. What are modules? Modules are just a way, usually in most languages, their packages, namespaces, and modules are the same thing. Usually, you know, like from the point of actually utilizing the language, they're the same thing. In JavaScript, there are a problem. There is no normal way to do modules. Everyone's created their own way of doing things. There's competing standards, AMD, CommonJS, the node, CommonJS, blah, 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 right? Modules in TypeScript are really just A, the language defined in a module, and it could be a file or not, and it's either public or private, one of the two. Now, the difference is, is that when you generate this, most people who generate TypeScript and applications are gonna use require, and they're gonna do modules that are each in its own individual file. So every class, is inside its own module, inside its own folder structure that matches, right? Very similar to Java or C Sharp. But you don't have to. You can do local modules and put them all in the same file. Up to you, okay? So local public and AMD JS. Really, it's all that really matters. I like AMD. Some people like common JS. That's the same. So they're bad packages, okay? So let's show you some basics of the modules. If I go into the basic, I have a module that looks like this, right? So if I paste this in to TypeScript, you can see that it will generate the define function, which if you're not familiar, is part of require. You define classes or modules, and then you can then require them via the required JS library. And at runtime, will asynchronously load them in the order that the dependency is required. So if you have multiple classes that depend on each other, require will handle loading each one in the proper order for you and defining them correctly, right? Pretty normal features of most programming languages, Ruby, Python, ActionScript, Java, C Sharp, whatever, except for JavaScript. Well, they utilize require to fix that. Pretty cool, huh? So you get all your classes loaded in, good to go, and you can instantiate them and call it a day. Pretty rad. Now you notice I have an export module, right? That means it's public. If I wanna make it local, I do this, and it will be local. Now, this defaults to the AMD uh, compilation method. But if I were to just take all this stuff out and define it with just that, you'll notice there is no define. It's a normal module. It's assumed at this point that all your modules are going to be defined in a single file. In fact, you don't even need this var com, but you could, right? It's doing the var com for the export specific way, right? So it can do the whole export space modules. So that's the basic module. Let's show you some AMD versus local. Now, again, yeah, I just showed you that. I'm going to show it again over here. AMD is really just asynchronous module definition. It's what most people in require do, but they also have the exports way of doing it as well, if you'll notice at the bottom. So it still does exports. It just depends on the compilation flag that you supply, okay? We don't really care about this. When you were using require, all you really care about is define and you're good to go. Cool, got it, makes sense. You excited yet? Integration, let's talk about integration. This is where most people go, okay, all these things look great, but I've got an existing code base, can't help it. I'm just gonna have to play with TypeScript and my unit test and nowhere else in my source package. Not necessarily true. The integration is the whole point of ambient declarations. And I, sh I just showed you how you do declare. You can say ambient, it's already declared, or it has these declarations already predefined. So when the compiler runs, it already knows what it's dealing with. It's not waiting for you to create a class and a module and export it. It assumes they're already there. And it's gonna follow the, the interface and use that to judge how much compiler help it's gonna give it or not. It's up to you, right? Which is great. You don't have to. You can say jQuery's uh, dynamic and call it a day, right? And the compiler will not complain at all. You can use interfaces, like I said, to define those particular 
objects. You can even treat interfaces as classes. Rather than writing a class, you can say, well, look, there's an interface. I'm loading it from this existing code base, which kind of is a class, but not really. It's already predefined. So I can create the interface and say, look, this is our, our way to integrate with that with strong typing. Because it could be a third party library. It could be code that's 10 years old. And you're not allowed to touch it because of technical debt, right? For whatever reason, TypeScript's got your back, OK? And again, if you're looking for type definitions, I got to show you this guy. If you go here, this guy has provided typed definitions that are pre-made for just about everything. So let's look at Angular, because that's the soup de that everyone loves, OK? And you see the type definitions for just about anything. It has the declare Angular, right, as being a already predefined variable. It has the interface for that particular function with the injects. It has the module of ng already there. So you can do ng dot. It's already provided as a module. It's already there. All the methods have strong typing. Now you'll notice they even have types, right? The element is of a type of jQuery of elements. So they defined a lot of those for you. So the compiler will help you to make sure that you're passing in the correct thing for a particular bootstrap. And notice they do some form of method overloading here in the interface that you can provide a, a variety of different methods. So even though TypeScript doesn't support method overloading at runtime, the interfaces do because again, there are methods that are overloaded and that's how functional programming works. You can fake overloading by changing how you work based on what arguments are passed in, right? So the interfaces got your back, got your back, man. So again, everything's here. I mean, Angular, Backbone, blah, 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 the whole internet's here if it's written in JavaScript. That's integration. You can make those interfaces. Compiling, let's talk about compiling. For the most part, you use the TypeScript compiler or TSC, which you can install via Node, or you can install other ways. I install it via Node, NPM, Node Packet Manager. You pass in the file, and you pass in a command line compiler such as the module type, I like AMD. Done, that's it. It compiles your JavaScript. Or you can do what all the cool kids are doing nowadays, using Grunt. So if I go in my Grunt file, you can see I have a TypeScript task and it says, all right, here's my base directory and source. Anything that has the .ts file suffix, I want to compile and shove in the build directory. The module type is AMD, and the target is ECMAScript file. Now, they have, you can play with this. You want to do three or five. Um, they have some other values. But the point is, is like, I want to target five. Five will work. It's fine. There's some minor features that act differently based on whether you do three or five. Nobody cares, it's good enough, works, unless you're you know, one of those functional kids like, no, I must act like this and have this. You can also set up a watch. So as you're typing TypeScript, it'll constantly compile. Okay, so as you save your file, as you create a new file, whatever, type no, node and grunt will watch your files for changes. Very similar to SAS if you're used with that or less. Okay, and don't worry about the open. All we care about is watch. So to watch that. So if you want to run this, uh, Where's my grunt? Grunt source file. My hello world. And I'm gonna save it. Okay. And we're gonna look at what's it generated in build. There you go. JavaScript as a module. Fantastic. Okay. Now we're gonna go to make it a greeter. Hit save. Notice it's going down here. Everything's good. But we have a missing or problematic uh, little creation here for this greeter. Notice how it's, I pass the string to the constructor, but the constructor takes a message module, right? So the compiler will tell you if you don't um, type things correctly, it'll tell you where it failed. And again, this is the point of using TypeScript is that if you misspell it or don't spell it correctly, it'll help you. Instance is a new message module dot com dot message. This is the only thing I don't like about the syntax is that it's a little verbose for modules. And they're, they have to be careful about changing it because it's not going to follow ECMAScript 6 modules definitions on how they're defined. So it's not really like a namespace you can define locally. And it's not compiled. I'll show you what I mean in a minute. So we can say a string, not a VO, right? This message is actually a VO. If you look at the message class, it is just a VO. It is a class of message with a type of greeting. And it has a method internally to do with the instance variable rather than being a string. Now that I have my message instance, I can pass it into the constructor, which notice you see how it's cast as a actual message type. When I hit save, the compiler will be happy, right? And then this is the example. I'm not even running my code or running unit tests or anything else. My grunt task is just watching as I code, right? I'm just running the normal types of compiler. When you have you know hundreds and hundreds of files, multiple developers with very strict API and requirements, the compiler is invaluable. Invaluable. It's valuable, but it's like so valuable, it's like oh my god, valuable, like invaluable, right? 
Clears mud, Jesse. Thanks. Notice I have an export a module and I export the class from that module to make it public, which means in another file I can import it via the module definition and use it. Now, there is a way utilizing local modules where you can reference the path using one, two, three. Right? That way, if you get rid of it, you just hit backspace. So one, two, three. It'll reference local modules this way, and this is fine because it's assumed that all of those are going to go in a single code base. And that's okay, but the problem with this is that it doesn't really work with multiple files on multiple code bases. So if you have you know, hundreds and hundreds of files, and then you have a build task or a compilation process that brings all these files together, right? a normal developer workflow for a large project, these are lame unless you're using Visual Studio. And most people don't do this. Most people are going to do export if they're going to code, you know, raw TypeScript or JavaScript. Okay, so just something to be aware. You have this option, but it's it's expecting the IDE to manually find these things, and you know, you're not going to type that <laughs> on a large project and you know refactor it. Not happening. You know what I mean? You want you want to have like you know tools, and that's the other thing is we, we don't really have good refactoring tools from doing this stuff. IntelliJ is not really there yet for TypeScript. They have watchers set up, but not from the refactoring perspective. But it's getting there. Otherwise, buy a PC and use Visual Studio. And again, you know, all this stuff will compile out down to normal JavaScript, right? And you can utilize it. It's from a required perspective. It's all prototypes, right? So it's optimized for that. Okay. And again, you'll notice that all this module stuff that I was writing is not in there. So all this like import, you know, the module up top. Let's take this out. All this stuff and all this stuff. If you look, it doesn't have any of that module definition. That is strictly for the compiler to know what module you're talking about. So when you actually compile it down, it has nothing to do with the code generated. So TypeScript is smart. It can keep its language specific stuff in there that is ECMAScript compatible, but it only compiles actually to usable JavaScript. And keep in mind, if you get tired of TypeScript, you don't want to use it anymore. Your project's still written in JavaScript, so you can still use it, right? So you could also experiment on your reading test. It's fine. Like a, a lot of the gateway people like try to experiment with CoffeeScript is they like to test only CoffeeScript in their unit test suite. So all their unit tests are write, written in CoffeeScript, but the rest of their code base is written in JavaScript, right? And that works out pretty well because they have a nice test bit to test CoffeeScript. So they don't have to like overly commit. You can do the same thing with TypeScript as well. You don't have to fully commit because once you set up a compiler in your source code, it gets you know a little tricky. It's like new developers are like, why are we not coding JavaScript? I don't understand. So when you actually utilize it, notice all you have to do is require main, right? You're doing a normal thing. You have your main, main file and you can require that main class and you're done. So that's what's really great about the compilation. So I've showed you those things, local versus public. So if you have some spare time, I've written an article about, it's called TypeScript for Actions for Developers. My name is Jesse Warding. Look it up on the internet. Here's the URL. I'll put it in the description. If you scroll down, I go over all the interesting features compared to ActionScript. And the reason that's important is ActionScript 1 and 2 were one of the first languages that followed ECMA 2, 3, and tried to pass the 4. After the ECMAScript 4 apocalypse happened, where they basically threw out 9% of all the stuff that language developers wanted, and they just kept it for the functional kids, um, there's a lot of things that were lost. But some of the cool you know, features that are in there TypeScript has that are better are really great. So if you're familiar with ActionScript 2, which is really syntactic sugar on top of JavaScript, just like CoffeeScript, this will break down some of those core features that are really valuable from a pragmatic perspective. You can look in the docs, that's fine, but the docs are very computer science-ish. And this is very, I'm trying to get things done today-ish, right? So constructors are really the really fun things. And then I talk about function literals, blah, 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 blah. So those are in there too. Why TypeScript? Beyond the fact that it was created by Anders Heisberg, the guy who built C Sharp, right? Delphi and Pascal. Well, it helps with multi person, multi developer, large code bases. That is the point of TypeScript. That strong typing helps it grow. So it's not just TypeScripting your normal, you know, strings and numbers and Booleans. No, no, no. It's your types, your classes have a nice contract and API that strongly typing compiler helps you. Okay? You can use the future JavaScript today. So if you want to use ECMAScript today, six today, you can do so. You're not going to use let, you're not going to use yield, <laughs> you're not going to use built-in language features that aren't there. It's strictly for the modules, the strong typing, the classes, the module definition, all that stuff's taken care of for you, you don't have to think about it, right? Inheritance, it's not a library, it's actually, you know, code gen code for you. And the compiler, if they find a better way in the future, you can recompile your code. See, that's what's so cool about compilers. You don't have to change your code. As the compiler improves, your code can improve if you just recompile. Awesome. It integrates with JavaScript. So the big risk with CoffeeScript is CoffeeScript is CoffeeScript. It's not JavaScript until you actually compile it. TypeScript, via ambulant decorations and interfaces, can integrate with anything. You don't have to like write a lot of code. You can say, uh, it's dynamic and it's called a day, right? It's three lines of code. You don't have to write like the entire J jQuery stuff, unless you want to go download it from that GitHub link I showed you, and I'll also put it in the description. 
It outputs good, readable JavaScript. The JavaScript it outputs, you can use, you can read, and it's efficient. It's object.prototype, except for the properties, which we've already explained why. The bad, one year later, still not 1.0. <laughs> like, Google Dart, as of like today or last week, is 1.0. TypeScript, still not 1.0. And it's Microsoft, so what's going on? I think they got a lot of work. I don't really know. Namespaces. So I have some namespace issues, and so do a lot of other people, and they just are not helpful. They, I, I, I think, I think, I think this is to encourage you to buy and stick with Visual Studio, which provides those solutions for you. But if you're trying to use TypeScript from a like a game development perspective, like a lot of the HTML5 guys are, unless you have namespaces, it makes it very difficult to do a large code base and not have really verbose type definitions. So if I want to have a, a like a value called type, notice how I have to you know do this long package path that's a reference. I mean that's awful. Why can't I just say message? You know. It's already referenced. Why can't I? You can't because the namespaces aren't a reference. They're not a true namespace. They're really just modules following the ECMAScript definition. So very frustrating. And it's it's been like been argued about. I'm on a thread that's over a year old. <laughs> so that's what's for for me. It's very frustrating. But overall, for you know doing a lot of your again, this is my my suggestion. Okay, there is a project called Project Ronda, Ron Randori by my good compadre, Michael Labriola. So if you go to randoryframework.com, I'm sorry, what really matters is this. See these purple? Those are all your classes that talk to your backend, okay? So not just a Java, you know, an Ajax call to call some web service and get some data and parses it. No, 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 no. Like, we're talking like business logic. Like, I gotta get some stuff, I gotta parse some stuff, I have to make decisions about that response. All of that business logic, the Randori framework actually defines that and codes that in C Sharp and then generates JavaScript. Everything else is done in HTML, JavaScript, and CSS, right? Whatever tools you want. But the core logic where it helps, my suggestion is just use TypeScript for that. So you can do all your business logic, the things that really could utilize strong typing and types and validation with additional unit tests and JS hinting and linting on top. That's where I believe the sweet spot for TypeScript is. So you don't have to code your entire project with it. You can do your service layer. It generates that to JavaScript. So you don't have to use TypeScript, you know, the actual source tree. It could just be that, that actual library or module that you include in, right? If you're doing a multiple developer team, somebody or a series of individuals can own that section. Very awesome, okay? If you're developing an API, you can also deploy it in both languages to support those who want the strong typing. So that is what I believe Jesse Warden believes the sweet spot is. And again, if you're curious, go to typescript.org. You can download everything. If you want to go in the playground, you can actually type JavaScript, the compiler here, and, and code hints and IntelliSense is really good for a web app. If you go to the main site, you scroll down, you can do the npm install g typescript, and that's it. You'll have all the compiler local you need. Okay, again, my name is Jesse Warden, by the way. Uh, you can hit me up on my blog. You can see my company, Web App Solution, if you got something you need built. We are consultants, so yes, we can come in and fix projects. We don't have to do things from soup to nuts. I'm on Twitter. I'm Jester Excel. You're more than happy to ask questions there. And I'm on Google Plus as well. If you got any other questions, I'd love to talk tech. Google Plus is better than, than Twitter. Don't forget to subscribe on the YouTube link. Thank you very much for your time. Hope that was helpful.